Well, please turn with me to the book of Isaiah. I want to read Isaiah chapter 61 to you this evening before we come to a couple of verses in Philippians chapter 1 later on. If you're using a church Bible, you'll find our reading on page 739. It's an incredibly rich chapter and... It's a thrill as a Christian to be able to read these words, so I'm going to read the whole chapter, and you can follow along with me. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long destroyed. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations. And in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I will delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Glory. Well, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. And verse 9, 10, and 11. Three verses tonight, we're moving quite quickly. <laughs> There's an American radio presenter who says that English is the perfect language for a preacher because it allows you to talk until you can figure out something to say. <laughs> Well, the Apostle Paul's nothing like that. He doesn't waste words. Brianna, just turn me down a little bit. Thanks. Paul doesn't waste words. We've read eight verses so far, and every single one of them is full of meaning and application. Last week we saw Paul's heart, and now the Holy Spirit takes us into his private prayer room. We're going to see how Paul prayed for the church in Philippi and we're going to learn how we should be praying for our church here or your church, wherever you regularly fellowship. Let's read these three verses and then we'll pray and ask for God's help as we look at his word. One Philippian, Philippians 1, did it again. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, as we read the words that Paul prayed, this is what we long for for ourselves, lives that are to the praise and to the glory of our God. So we pray, Heavenly Father, as we listen and as we read your word this evening, that we would know the Lord Jesus speaking to us, that we would be aware of the Holy Spirit dealing with our hearts, challenging us where we need to be challenged, convicting us of sin, showing us where it is, infusing us to cut it out and to live instead for our Saviour. Oh, we long to be more like Him. But we know we need your help for that. We need your help to change. We're such creatures of habit. We chase after our old selves all the time. Forgive us and help us. We want to live for our Saviour. Draw near to us then this evening and glorify yourself in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in verse 6, Paul is absolutely confident that God is going to finish the good work that he started in Philippian hearts. So why then does he pray? If he's so sure that God's got this, why does he pray? We might ask the same question. If God is truly in control of everything, why should we pray? Now, there are many answers to that question, but I want to give you two this evening. Just two very quickly key answers, two reasons. One, because the Lord Jesus commands his people to pray. It's as simple as that. Luke chapter 18 verse 1 says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. If your wife asks you to do something and you don't know why, I'm sure that doesn't happen very often, but if you don't know why, you sometimes ask her. But sometimes you just do it because you, you trust her. No one fully understands the relationship between our praying and God doing. But when we find ourselves saying, I don't know why, well, we fall back on what we do know. I don't know why Christ asks me to pray if he's in control, but I do know that he's all good, and I know that he works all things for his glory and for my best. And so when he asks you to pray, Christian, will you say, not until I know why? Or will you say, I don't know why? But I trust you. I love you. And so I'll pray. Secondly, because the Lord Jesus prayed. If anyone didn't need to pray, it was him. He knew God's sovereignty better than anyone else. But he always made time for prayer. And that should give us great confidence to pray. Our, our prayers are not made worthless by God's sovereignty. You think, of, you think of Daniel in the Old Testament reading the prophecies of Jeremiah and, and seeing them actually happening around him. Now that didn't make him step back and say, well, God's obviously got this. He went to prayer. He prayed. He saw these things happening and he prayed. And God used those prayers. They were the means that God used to finish the good that he had started. Paul's confidence that God would finish what he'd started at Philippi didn't make him complacent. It, it motivated him to pray all the more. It filled him with the belief that his prayers would be answered. So we look then, what did Paul pray? I want you to see six things then in these three verses. First of all, that your love may abound more and more. Now, if there was one word that characterized the church at Philippi, it would be that word, love. This is the church that loved. And so it might seem strange to us that the first thing that Paul prays for is more love. He's saying, you've got it. You're doing it, but now you need more. Don't take what you've got for granted. Don't stagnate, but work harder than ever before at loving each other and loving the Lord Jesus. Now we might look at our little church here and we might say, hey, people are always welcomed and made to feel at home. The fellowship after our meetings is always warm. 
So we've got that sorted. What else do we need to work on? But we can't think like that. We can't think like that because the blessings that we enjoy are not the result of our hard work. They're not from us, but they're gifts from God. And as soon as we stop praying, thanking him and asking him for more and, and pursuing fellowship and working at it or whatever other good we receive from him, we'll quickly lose it. Apply this personally too. Think about yourself. Let me tell you a hard truth that we all need to grasp. There is no area of your life where you are doing well enough. It's a pleasant thing to hear on a Sunday night, isn't it? There's no area of your life where you're doing well enough. Now the devil would want you to believe that. He would tell you that. You say, I love Christ enough. He says, quite right. You got it. You say, I love God's people enough. He says, Amen. You say, I give enough of my time and my money to the church. I go to enough meetings. He and all of hell with him says, oh yes, quite enough. But the Holy Spirit never says enough. God never says enough. There's one time when he said enough. And that was when he died on the cross and said it's finished. That's the only time. But when he looks at us, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, he says, more and more and more love for Christ, more satisfaction to be had in him, more commitment, more giving of yourself to this work, more love for Christ's people and for the lost. May it abound what you've got. May it abound more and more. The second thing that Paul's pray, Paul prays for is that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. You know, there are many churches that are full of knowledge but have no love. And there are other churches where you will be welcomed and made to feel very comfortable and at home but the sermon is weaker than the tea. We can't be like either. There's no room for us to be either. Paul, you see, he doesn't pray that the Philippian church would be a place where everyone feels good. They must have love, but real love is rooted in truth. It starts with minds that grasp God's word. You see, as we understand more from this book about our sinfulness and about Christ's perfections and about the price that was paid for us at the cross, those things naturally come out in our lives. They can't just stay in your head. They're too big for your head. They must fill your whole life and come out in acts of love. When you take a, a Panadol, it doesn't just numb your mouth, but it works through your whole system and provides relief to the whole body. In the same way, God's truth doesn't just stay in your mind, but it works through your whole life. When you sow seeds, you don't expect to harvest seeds, do you? That's not what you're looking forward to. And when the Holy Spirit plants truth in your mind and heart, it must come to fruition. It doesn't stay as a seed, but it must grow and outgrow in acts of love. Paul prayed that the Philippians would abound in love rooted in truth. That you might abound more and more, that your love might abound, sorry, more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. This is how we must pray for our church. This is why I pray before every sermon and we pray, Father, help all of us as we read and listen and fill our heads and hearts with love for the Lord Jesus. The third thing I want you to see is that Paul prays this so that you might discern what is best. Verse 10. There are more plastic flamingos than there are real ones. You know that? Sometimes I think there are more fake gospel preachers than real ones. There is so much rubbish 
out there. There is so much twisted doctrine sold as orthodoxy. How do we discern what is good? How do we work out what to listen to, which books to read? You need two things. Love and knowledge. Look what it says, verse 9 into 10. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best. You need both of those things, love and knowledge. When I was in university, some of my friends were being visited regularly by two Mormon elders and my friends didn't know a lot about Mormonism and so they asked a few of us to come round on the next night they were scheduled to visit. We went and the, the Mormons used the standard line that they always use about how close Christianity and Mormonism are to each other. They're so similar to each other, we believe the same things and so we should just work together. They said to us, we believe in Jesus, we love the Lord Jesus. And my friend Jason, who came with me, said, well, that's the most important thing. If we can agree on that, we can agree. We shouldn't have any problems. We can agree to work together. But I'd done my research. And I said, hang on a second. Because the Jesus that you claim to love is very different from the Jesus that I love. You don't believe that Jesus is God. Well, they couldn't deny it. But they carried on with the same tack. They said, well, look, you can't even list five things that we disagree on. Well, as I said, I'd done my reading, so it took 10 seconds to rattle off five things that we, didn't disagree, that we disagreed on. And Mormons believe that you can lose authority in a conversation, and once it's gone, you can't speak again until you regain it. And so I knew I had the upper hand, and that was my opportunity then to, to lecture them on the trinity and the heresies of Mormonism. By the end of the conversation, one of the elders was angry, the other one was crying. My friend Jason had no knowledge. And without it, he couldn't discern what was best. His gospel was like a marshmallow that could be twisted and bent and molded out of shape. I had knowledge, but to my shame, and often my real regret, I had no love. And so my gospel was hard, cold, and empty, like the barrel of a gun. Apply love and knowledge to that situation. Wouldn't it have been better for us to, to challenge those ideas that they had? That were wrong. But then in love, to genuinely and gently appeal to them, to see the, the falseness of what they were saying and to believe on the Lord Jesus. Only with these two things, love and knowledge, can we handle any situation to the glory of God. We must apply head and heart because without them, without one, there is no way of discerning what is best. The fourth thing that Paul prays for is that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Now, every Christian must work at being pure and blameless. But the devil would mitigate that. He'd make it seem less serious, less important than it is. He says things to you like this. Hey, look, you're already holy, so you don't need to worry about cutting out sin. You don't need to, to stress about developing godly habits. But we don't take that because we know God's word says, 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. But we read words like that and Satan jumps in our ear again and he says, well, that kind of holiness is just impossible. It's unattainable. And we might be tempted to believe him. But do you know that in reality, holiness is totally 
practical. Look at the simple brilliance of Paul's prayer. It's, it's like a staircase to holiness. Follow me step by step. Verse 9. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. This is the way, this is the road to holiness. There's an analogy that you've probably heard before, it's very old, about a cat and a pig. And if a cat falls in mud immediately, it starts licking itself clean. That's the Christian. But if a pig finds mud, well, he wallows in it. That's the man without Christ. When he finds sin, he finds what makes him happy. He's in his element. But though a Christian falls many times a day, every time he goes to the cross, he cleans himself up, he comes repentant to the Lord Jesus by love and knowledge. He discerns that the mud of sin is not for him and so we are always picking ourselves up and aspiring to be pure and blameless. Just like the Apostle Paul, we have the day of Christ fixed in our vision. There is a day coming when we'll stand before our Saviour and explain what we've done with our lives and the gifts that he's given to us. None of us wants to say, I took those things and wallowed in the mud of sin. The fifth thing that Paul's pray, Paul prays for is that you would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Colin taught me everything I know about gardening and one of the most crucial lessons he taught me was how to cut the laterals. That's what they're called, isn't it, Colin? The laterals of tomato plants so that the energy of the plant is put into producing the fruit. But you need to know which bits are the laterals. <laughs> you need to know which bits to trim, otherwise you do what I did the first time and drop off all the leaves and the bits with the little yellow blossom off because that doesn't look good. You need discernment. With love and knowledge, we can discern what is good for us. And with Holy Spirit help, we see things in our lives that are bad for us, that are sapping energy that could be put into good things. And with more of his help, we can cut them out. We learn through the scriptures how to stay away from the mud of sin and how to obey Christ. It, when we do that, it brings us into a closer relationship with him. We put off the old self and we put on Christ. We drink less from the broken cisterns of the world, the muddy water of sin, and we drink instead from the sweet, pure water of life that comes from the Lord Jesus. We cut off the things we don't need and we bring the energy of Christ into producing fruit of righteousness. So this is how a Christian operates. And as I sat down looking at this this afternoon, I was thinking, look, this is probably the most important sermon I've preached since I've been here. Of all of the things that we've heard and all of the things I've said to you, there's probably no more important lesson than a Christian who wants to live as a Christian can learn than this one. This is how it works day to day, living for God, living for holiness. Every decision that you make, every morning when you get up, you're applying these things, love and knowledge, that you might discern what is best and then do it. That's it. That's the process. And so you're to ask yourself every time, is this job good for me? Knowledge, love, discern what's best and do it. What hobbies should I have? Knowledge and love. Discern what's best and do it. Who should I marry? What church should I go to? How do we school the kids? Where do I live? How do I spend my money? Who am I going to spend my time with? The Christian meets every one of these decisions with this process, this Christ-honoring, Christ-centered philosophy. Love and knowledge. Discern what is best and do it. Mm -hmm. 
It's what we do. And we do it that our lives might be full with the fruit of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. Look at the last thing that Paul prays. All of this thing that we've read so far. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you might be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the top step. This is where everything has been pointing towards. Now, a fruit farmer doesn't show off his orchards in the middle of winter, does he? He might have a thousand trees, all in beautifully neat rows. But when there's no fruit, when there's no life, they look skeletal, sad, and depressing. There's no glory, no joy for the farmer. There's nothing to show off about looking out on that field. And in the same way, a Christian with no love and knowledge, with no discernment, can have no fruit in their life and bring no glory to God. Earlier we read that beautiful chapter in Isaiah and we read these words in verse 3. Talking about God's people, he says this. They will be called oaks, trees of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. In other versions, you read it this way, planted for his own glory. What kind of fruit do you get on an apple tree? Apples. What kind of fruit do you get on a righteousness tree? Fruit of righteousness. Those are the trees that God plants in his orchard. And that's how we must think about our church. It's an orchard. Each of you are individual trees. And you need to ask yourself this important question tonight. Am I bearing fruit? Is there fruit in my life? Am I bearing fruit for my king? Does my life bring glory to God? Now, none of you can say, I don't know how. Because Paul has laid it out so practically for us. And I feel like I've complicated it for us this evening. But you can go home and read these words and, and ask for the Holy Spirit to make it clearer for you, to you than I have this evening. But Paul has laid it out practically. You live every day by this Christ-focused philosophy. Love and knowledge, discern and do. Now, if you've spent many years living fruitlessly, you can start tonight. You can pray for yourself as Paul prayed for the Philippians and as the Lord Jesus prays for you right now. This same prayer. You might feel like there's no life in the branches anymore. Like it's been so long since the roots sucked up any of that sweet, refreshing water that comes from the Lord Jesus. But he won't give up on you. He hasn't given up on you yet. He can make the most pitiful tree to blossom. To bear the sweetest fruit. You know that even a bruised reed, my Savior wouldn't break. There are some of you here who've never loved the Lord Jesus. You stumble on that very first step, love. You have the love of friends and family, but nothing of the greatest love of all. No love for Christ. Without that life-changing love, there's no hope of bearing any fruit of righteousness. You are a withered old stump. No life no righteousness and no hope of heaven. Now Jesus said that every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Hell will have every fruitless tree, every life that is Christless. 
that the Lord Jesus could bring life to your heart this evening. If you would repent and believe on him, the great vine dresser, the greatest gardener of all, would graft you even into himself and his own pure, eternal life would flood in. He would make you holy. He'd make you righteous, fruitful. He'd make you glorifying to God. And then one day the great gardener will come and he'll collect his harvest. Take you home to be with him in glory forever. Let's pray. Living Lord Jesus, we pray that you'd help us to see that the simple and practical challenge that comes to us this evening from your word. Father, we pray that we'd be encouraged by the truth that, yes, we've been made holy because we're in the Lord Jesus. And yet still we can live holy because of this new nature that you've given us. There is a, a nobility with Holy Spirit help to fight sin, to put it to death. We pray then that we take this, this challenge to heart. That by your word we might love and discern what is right. With your help, we might do it. Oh, help us to be Christians that bear much fruit. That bring glory to our God. Change our hearts. Draw them to yourself. Fill us with love and thankfulness to our Saviour who has grafted us into himself, who has put life into our old dead roots and branches, planted us in his orchard as trees of righteousness. Oh, may we live up to this high calling you've placed on our lives. May we always have the day of Christ fixed in our minds. We long to honour you. May our lives be a, a constant source of praise to you, our living God. We pray it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.